Okay, I think it's probably time we get started. Um, so before I introduce Ed to everyone, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I embrace their continued connection to this place. I'd also like to extend this respect to elders from other communities who may be joining us remotely today. So it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Professor Ed Hovey, who I've got a bit of a blurb here that he doesn't know what I'm going to say, but let's see what comes out. He's the Executive Director of Melbourne Connect um, and a Professor at the University of Melbourne School of Computing and Information Systems. Now, Ed is the bomb when it comes to artificial intelligence. So he completed a PhD in computer science in artificial intelligence at Yale and was one of the first 17 fellows of the Association for Comput Computational Linguistics and is also a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Um, for over a decade, Ed was co-director of research for the Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence for Command, Control and Inoperable Data Analytics. I've never had to say so many words that I can't really say in my life. President of the International Association of Computational Linguistics and in the early 2000s, he was president of the International Association of Machine, Tra Machine Translation and was president of the Digital Government Society. He knows a lot about AI, chat GPT and digital intelligence, I think. Uh, so Ed's research has taken him around the world and we talked a lot about this where I met him at graduate research supervision training. It was probably one of the best things that came out of the training. He really has, a, has done amazing things around the world um, and he's focused on computational sem semantics of language and addresses various areas in natu natural language processing and data analytics. I'm not going to say the rest of it. He can tell you everything he does. There's too many more words on this. He'll tell you what he does. And I think we're going to learn a lot about ChatGPT and AI today. So I'll hand it over to Ed. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hello, everybody. It's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm, I must say, I must admit that I thought I only have half an hour, so I didn't prepare a lot of stuff. I can tell you a lot of things, but I'll, I'll cut it short and then we can have a discussion afterwards, and then you can see if you have any particular questions on this theme. This theme, chat GPT, large language models, generative AI, this happens to be by pure luck, I think, exactly the field I've worked on for about 30 years. I started doing natural language processing, which is part of AI in graduate school, because I was interested in like what's, what's in my mind, right? What makes me different from some, my mother was a Christian scientist, my father was agnostic, my grandfather was Dutch reformed. We had a lot of tension about what are you in the family? What is their religion? Do you have a soul? And I thought, I'm a scientist. I'm gonna measure this thing. I'm gonna build a computer program and I'll see, does it have a soul or not? And I sit here, you know, some years later, and I still don't know what to say about that question. But I've had fun actually doing this work and learning what happens when you say language is a window into the mind. Language is a great way of trying to understand what am I inside here? And why do I do the funny things I do? Not at the level of neurons, right, which is a very low level. It's very hard to describe. But one level higher where you sort of talk about functions and emotions and goals and plans and knowledge structures and things like this. That's where AI lives. And that's where natural language processing is a piece of AI lives. And it looks at vast swaths of language, takes machine learning, and does the machine learning on top of the language to find the patterns. And then you can go to Google. You can go build, I don't know, translation systems. You can do all kinds of things, make a lot of money. Or you can sit and say, I want to use these things to figure out what happens inside my mind. Who am I, right? In November 1 of last year, November 1st of last year, OpenAI, this little company in San Francisco, they announced ChatGPT. And suddenly, my world has been turned upside down. Most graduate students, PhD students I know, have an existential crisis. They don't know if their thesis is worth anything anymore, because what they were planning to do this machine does, and does better, and does more. And so they say, oh my god, right? You, you work on machine translation? This thing can translate. I've seen it speak Latin, Swedish, German, English, a bit of Japanese, all kinds of languages. You think this, you want to do text summarization, automatic summarization, you give a long text, a short one? This thing does that. 
You want to do question answering and information retrieval, go to Google and find your answer. This thing does that. This thing does amazing things, and it's not clear exactly how. OpenAI, the people who built this, don't know exactly how. If you read the literature, if you read what they publish, you read what the Microsoft people publish, the Google people publish, they publish things around this, but at the core, nobody understands exactly why it is as good as it is. And that's exciting, and that's disquieting, right? You don't like to be in a field where you say, shit, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. They look at me and they say, you're useless, right? On the other hand, we do have this thing. But it's not perfect. It hallucinates up and down. It's full of gaps, all kinds of things. How can we figure it out? How can we, how can we measure it? How can we test it? There aren't even ways of testing it, of measuring it. So there's a lot of open questions, and we have to now understand what this thing does, what this is about, and how we can explore its potential. And then when I come to you, in two days' time, I'm going to downtown. There's some fancy business conference in the Hilton there, or the Hyatt, or whatever it's called. Business people come to me all the time. What must I do? Is this thing going to eat my job? People in other places, you would be surprised. People in, from all walks of life come and say, is this thing going to kill me? Is this thing, what, what's, what's happening here? Right? And I think I'm not worried. But it's hard when I cannot explain exactly how this thing works. It's actually quite difficult as a scientist to be able to say, don't be worried, it's all right. And they say, are you sure? And I have to say, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to try to tell you how this works, to give you a rough intuitive sense of how it works. There's a little bit of mathematics, but don't worry. And then let's have a discussion, because you have a particular interest, and I'm sure that you have a use in mind where you would like to use this thing. I can tell you some uses I have in mind for this in biomedical type space. And then we can explore together, because I think this thing is going to change our lives. Before the end of this decade, we're all, I think, going to have access to our own personal little chat GPT, It'll live on the cloud. You'll access it through Telstra or your favorite you know, cell phone provider. And it will know all your secrets, your passwords, your everything. And while you sleep, it'll go and do what it needs to, to help you. And tomorrow, it'll tell you stuff. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. There'll be a lot of them. There'll be a lot of them. It's going to be interesting, right, how we get from here to there. And what can you do to make your patient's life easier, to make your colleague's life easier, to make your children's life easier? So let's look at this. OK? So my background, <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for an hour. So a little bit more on my background. After living in Los Angeles for a while at a research institute where I built a large group, I moved to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, which is sort of the main center of computer science. It's sort of the number one school in the world, or maybe one and two, depending on how you measure. And so that's very interesting there. There was an institute just devoted to language technology, about 150 masters and PhD students, and about 50 faculty members just for this area. And then I went to DARPA for two years because I thought there's more we can do than just do more research. So as you know, DARPA is this, this government-funded institute in Washington that funds people to do things. So they brought the internet, they paid for a GPS, global positioning satellites, they paid for all kinds of things also in the biomedical area. And I was working on mis- and disinformation on the fact that our societies are being torn apart by social media discussions and little bots and things that are exacerbating differences. And it's not nice what's happening. It's going to get worse. So I was working on, that, on ways to try to combat that there. And then I decided I want to do something more linked to industry and see if we can take the technology and link it to industry. So I came here to Melbourne Connect, which is a great place because we have in the building probably we have 13 or 14 medium-sized companies, another 20 going up to 40 small companies or just pieces of them. And we have all of engineering and, 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 uh, and information technology in the building. And we have a daycare center and all kinds of things there, and research centers, all kinds of stuff in the building. So it's a very nice environment for linking people together. And that's part of my job half the time. The other half of the time is just being a professor in, in computer science and having students and writing proposals and stuff. So that's where I'm coming from, OK? So I'm a researcher at heart. So AI, let's talk about AI for one slide. AI has an interesting history. AI started in the 1950s 
late 1950s, after the Second World War, when about 10 people got together at Dartmouth University and said, we have this thing called a computer, and you can program a computer, it's not special purpose, can you program it to make intelligence? And they called the word AI, artificial intelligence, which some say is a bad name, and they identified 10 problems like machine translation and learning and things like this. And they said, well, by the end of two, 1990, maybe 2000, we're going to certainly have all this stuff. We're now reached 2020, and we don't have, we have only some pieces of intelligence that we can actually reliably computationalize. There are robots that build cars. There are natural language systems that you could speak to and have dialogues with, and they will help you make a plane booking or something. There are planning systems and scheduling systems that can plan your, your party for you or something like this. But there are many, many more open questions we just don't know how to do. We don't have, until ChatGPT, we don't have, I would say, unrestricted natural language understanding. It just isn't there. And then comes ChatGPT. And now I don't know how to, how to answer that question. So things go very fast and things are very interesting here. In the original phase of AI, up to about the 1970s, people didn't really know much. So they took any area and they said, I want to do something. So in the biomedical area, for instance, people built expert systems you've heard of, which is just deep rule sets, nested rules, which do diagnostics. So there was a thing called a mycin and a thing called internist and others, and they had certain success rates. So you present with all the characteristics of the patient, and you go through your little yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and the bottom it says, I think so much percentage probability this patient has X, and you say yes or no, right? So the benefit of that was, well, a disadvantage is it takes a lot of work to build a thing like this, right? As you know from your training. The benefit is when it's done its thing, it tells you exactly what its reasoning was. You know exactly, right? It could be right, it could be wrong, but you know where to go fix if it's wrong, right? So in the 1980s, people realized you can do this for certain very circumscribed areas, maybe like certain kind of certain engineering problems or certain diseases. But in general, in general, the world is more complex than just a bunch of rules can get to. You can, you can break your heart. You will never be able to write a set of rules that will understand even one paragraph of Harry Potter. Right? You just won't be able to do it. So machine learning became all the rage. People said, well, I'm going to learn these rules by myself. I'm going to get a, what's called a training data. Training data. I'm going to get a lot of input examples and corresponding output examples for whatever task I want, diagnosis. And I'm going to, again, develop an algorithm that's going to look input-output and try to find out what are the main, the important characteristics and the combinations of them to make the right prediction. And so a whole field of machine, trans machine learning came up. And there's departments now, machine learning, et cetera, people. There's probably several hundred different algorithms of machine learning. And the most recent one, and they do, sorry, they do pretty good, right? So for tumor classification, just looking at a picture of the tumor and then classifying, is it cancerous or not, et cetera, that's better than humans. That's been better than humans for about five or six years. Don't tell the humans, but it's better than they are. It's more accurate, right? So there's IBM Watson. You heard about the Jeopardy television game where the people and, and this thing beat the, the um, world champion at question answering. This thing, I was on the advisory committee for that team. They were really happy when it happened. <laughs> I didn't expect it to happen. I can show you the graphs, but if you look at Ken Jennings, the world's best performer, he reliably scores at a certain level, and this machine reliably scores slightly lower. But on this particular game, on that particular evening, when they had the boxes and he chose the wrong box for double jeopardy, which doubled his score, you saw his, when he chose the box and it wasn't double jeopardy, you saw him just sink, because he knew he'd lost that game. Of course, the machine chose the other box, it was double jeopardy, it beat him, and they never ever played the game again, right? They <laughs> never ever opened that again. Ken Jennings would have beat the machine, would have beaten the machine. You, you have to play about 72 games to get a statistical reliable um, result. But they did beat, and they went down in history. And so IBM scored a lot, and they created this thing called Watson, and they sold it all over the world. And it's just an empty shell. It's a piece of junk. So don't pay a million dollars for that. OK? But machine learning became then a big thing. And inside machine learning, there were some guys, Jeff Hinton, you might have heard the name, Jan LeCun, 
who kept the faith, a thing called a, a little, tiny little neural network, which I'll describe in a second, called a perceptron, was developed in the late 1950s already. And people at MIT and others tried with this, and it never really properly worked. And they kept trying and trying. And this guy, Jeff Hinton, at CMU and then at, at Toronto, for all his life came. And then it's suddenly, at some point, compute became large enough that you can have very big machines. Data became accessible enough that you can have half the internet if you just can suck it all in. You have the money to do that. And these machines, you could put together a lot of these little neurons together and put a certain crucial little function inside. I'll show you in a second. And then suddenly, these things took off. And they could start doing amazing learning uh, tasks. They could perform at least 10% better, on average, than traditional machine learning approaches could do. So early on, about 12, 15 years ago, one of the early ones of these beat the world's best Go player. You know the game Go with the black and white stones? That's a lot more complex than chess. I was in Holland at the time speaking to a world chess and, and games expert player when this was announced. Just before it was, the day before, it was still under embargo. He said to me, he was worried, he said, I expected this result, but 15 years from now, I didn't think it's going to happen this soon. But it was neural networks. It's a different kind of learning that's a lot of little pieces together that jointly figure out and reinforce themselves and so on. Neural networks may be a bad name. It's not really neurons in the sense that we speak of neurons in the brain. But it has a certain similarity, and that's why they use the name. But the reinforcing capability of a lot of little pieces that each perform a very simple computation and on top recursively actually has a lot of power. And that gave rise to what we now call deep learning, deep neural networks, Large language models are a particular kind of them that deal with language, but there are image models and other things like this. Some people call them foundation models. The world is in flux. These terms are coming out. Basically, you have a lot of data, much more than traditional amounts. You throw it into a large enough sized neural network. You train it to do certain things. There's different regimes of training. There's different architectures of the networks. And then eventually, you get a result that comes out. And then you discover my result is better than all the machine learning that has gone before. And I don't really know why. I just put the training data in and it worked. And I do a little snipping here and a little testing there, but there aren't any good methods of explaining. The, the, the task of explaining the reasoning of a neural network is a big deal now. Most of my students, when they graduate, it's part of their thesis. How do I explain? How do I understand what the hell this thing is doing? When it makes a result and you press and you say, why did you do this? It's not able to tell you why, like a human is. It just says, that was my training data and that's my network. There, take it or leave it. When the thing is wrong, you have no idea what to do about that. It's a very unsatisfactory position to be in as a scientist, right? You want to at least understand your machine. If I give you a car, and it's a great car, and it goes fast, and it's beautiful, and I say, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> if it breaks, if you crash, don't talk to me, right? Will you buy that car? Of course you won't buy that car. You think you're crazy? No, right? So we're in a very strange position now, and that's the whole world is feeling this position. Government is worried about this. Big companies are worried about this. Everybody's kind of, do we trust this thing or don't? What are we doing? And inside the business, everybody's working as hard as possible to try to figure it out. OK. Now, when you ask ChatGPT itself, What's going to happen with biomedicine? It gives you all kinds of stories here. Drug discovery, I'm going to help with that. Medical imaging and diagnostics, I'm going to help with that. Data augmentation and synthetic data generation, I'm going to help with that. Right Here, um, personalized medicine and treatment optimization, I'm going to help biological sequence generation. And you look at it and you say, whoa, whoa, this looks very good, better than I could have written myself. No, but is it true? Is it trustworthy? You look at those words, and you're experts, you probably say, well, yeah, perhaps. Doesn't look wrong, does it? But you're missing some details, right? If you were hiring somebody, and they said, OK, I'm going to do this thing, and they told you that, you'd say, well, tell me more. Tell me more, and you'll dig in a little bit. We need to tell me more a little bit with ChatGPT to find out what its limits are and why it reaches those limits. So that's the point of this talk here, OK? So machine learning, I mentioned before, has sort of three phases. 
The first phase is you decide what problem you want to attack, and then you train the machine. So you get your data, you get your inputs, you get your outputs, and typically you structure your inputs in some way, you pull out the pertinent characteristics, the features they call them, you, you do something to organize it to get rid of unnecessary noise, redundancy, all kinds of stupid things, and you get the outputs nice, you say, I want this, 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 you clean it up. So the machine has a simple kind of a task to try to figure out out of this vector of inputs, you want that particular output, here's my vocabulary, my library of possible outputs, here's my library of possible inputs, I end up in a high dimensional space, right, with all the inputs there, and then one output dimension, I've got to figure out how to cut my space so that I get to the right point. When you've done the training, and there's lots of ways of doing training, then you do the testing. So every so often you say, okay, here's a new case you've not seen before, it's called held out data. You throw it in, you look what the machine says, and you say, Right or wrong? And hopefully you see your machine get better and better and better and better and better as it learns. That's the typical case, and it sort of asymptotes out. And neural networks tend to asymptote out higher than other techniques. And then you say, this is as good as it's going to get. <clears throat> I don't have more data to train. My machine is saturated, something, something, something. Take the machine and go and be happy. And then people take the machine and they do what they want to do. And then when things go wrong, then they say, hmm. My self-driving car drove into another person. Now what? Who do I blame? And so you run to the AI and ethics people. There's a whole center for AI and ethics in Melbourne Connect. This is becoming a very big story now. The ethical slash legal connotations of AI. As AI matures, as we in our lives, as society adopts AI, we're going to start having more and more ethical slash legal questions. And it's not clear whether you can treat an AI as a person. You can treat a corporation as a person. Should you treat an AI as a person? Jeannie Patterson, a colleague of mine, she's in the law school, she says, no, it's AI is, is, is just working together with someone. If, if, I, if you do some service for me, whether it's diagnosis or something like this, I don't care if you use a machine or not. You use a calculator, you use something else, I don't care. It's your responsibility as a company to give me my service. Now you start using ChatGPT, I don't care. It's your responsibility. I say, what about when ChatGPT is doing it by itself? I say, well, somebody made the company around ChatGPT. They're just using ChatGPT as an employee. It's the company. Yes? No? We can argue about this. It becomes very interesting when the thing becomes a self-standalone agent, when it's your bus driver for your children's bus going to school and it makes a mistake. What then? Hmm? So let's look now at, let's get a little more technical now, at machine learning. Does anyone know how machine learning works? Shall I do a very simple example? Let's do a simple example. Let's say I have an iris. I have a whole bunch of irises. Turns out to be there, th it turns out there are three kinds of iris, Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. And if you look at the iris, there's really only four features that make a difference. The length of the petal, the width of the petal, the length of the sepal, which is this funny little thing there, and the width of the sepal. Color is immaterial, etc. So I can build a little table that looks like this, that says sepal length, 5.1, sepal width, 3.5, petal length, 1.4, petal width, 0.2. What kind of thing? It's a setosa. And I can build this big, big, big table. That's my training data, right? Now you look at this as a human and you say, mm, can I find any patterns here? And as a human, you very quickly notice, oh, when the petal width, column four, is kind of short, then we have setosa. And when the petal width is sort of in the middle, we have versicolor, and when the petal width is bigger, we have virginica. The rest of the things are scrambled all over, I don't see any pattern. Yes, you see that, right? It's the job of the machine learning algorithm to figure out which of the features are good and which are irrelevant and to then sort them in such a way to get the maximal performance. That's its job. Okay? So now, let's build a little neural network. We take this big table we have, and we take little two neurons, just two neurons, and we wire each neuron to get its numbers. It takes the numbers from the four fields here, and this little neuron on the left, he takes the numbers, and the neuron on the right, he takes the numbers. And inside that neuron, we put a little function, a little mathematical function that swallows the numbers and produces one number going up, okay? And so there's, let's say, a simple function. This r, the value going up, is 
some number, A1, times the sepal length, and another number times the sepal width, et cetera, et cetera. We have to determine, the machine has to learn which numbers are important. Now, we know that A4 is important, petal width. That's the one, right? The others, we don't really care. So we can make A1 and A2 and A3 zero or close to zero. We don't care. But A4, we must cl make close to one because that's the one that's going to tell us what to do, right? That's what the machine's got to learn. So we make, let's say, two more neurons. And you can make it's an unclear art as to how many neurons you need, how many wide, and how deep. It is still completely unclear in machine learning theory what's the representational limits of a size of a certain configuration of this. That's something people are working on there. It's just an art. So people just put a row of these things in and put more and more. Typically, typically, now you have, oh, I'll come to that in a second, you have a certain size, I'll tell you in a minute. It's called a transformer. At the very top, you put your little special classifier neuron on there. This one swallows all the results from coming below and has one little function that says, if my values are less than something, I'm choosing setosa. And if they're more than something, I'm choosing virginica. And if there's else, I'm choosing versicolor, etc. It's trained. How do you train it? You give thousands of examples in the table at the bottom. And then you give the right answer at the top. And if the thing guessed the right, are you initialized? You just give all random numbers in the middle in the little arrows at the beginning and uh, in the function for the A's there. And if the thing did the right answer, you say, oh, you gave me the right answer. Your A's are good here. So let me bonus you on the good A's. If the A was small, I'm going to make you smaller. If the A was big, I'm going to make you bigger. That's called back propagation. You, you take the good values and you push them down. You make everybody happy, strong. You give them more of what they need. If the answer was wrong, then you weaken them. A, a big number becomes smaller, and a small number becomes bigger. You, you balance this out until you sort of reach the optimum balance point. That's not exactly what happens, but it's close, right? So typically, a typical modern neural network called the transformer just has about 12 layers, about 100, say, 50 to 100, maybe a few, a few more width, and you just wire everything to everything. There have been many other architectures called recursive neural, ne uh, neural network, convolutional neural network, long short-term memory, et cetera. But they all eventually come to this thing. This is sort of the maximal generalization of this. And they, they look like this, right? So you must not be afraid of a neural network. It's just a bunch of little things here, little nodes all wired together, pushing some number up, each node calculating what they must say when they push the number up. The crucial thing. The crucial secret is what happens, that little function, which I wrote there as r equals, that's called a linear function, right? That's just plus, plus, plus. The real function in there, if you do plus, doesn't work. What they realized in the 1970s and later is you need what's called a nonlinear function, right? And so you have to have something that, that can squeeze numbers a certain way. So the, the currently popular one is called tan h. You have learned this in high school, tan, and tan, a hyperbolic tan. It looks like that sort of s curve, that funny curve there. The way to understand it is as follows. If I give you three features, red, blue, and green, and yellow, right? And at the bottom, they're equal. But I know in my heart one of these features is important. The others are not important. After training, if I can squeeze the small ones down and can stretch the, the important one up, then I have more weight on the important one. That's what this function is doing. If you look on the left side, on the, X, on the Y axis, notice because I had this funny little S curve in there, if I put yellow in the middle, then when I'm coming after my, my when I move over to the left, the output side, suddenly my, y, my, my yellow is big, but my blue is small, my red is small. That means anything that I decide is an unimportant feature, I can push into red and blue space, and anything like the sepal width, which I think is a, a petal width, which I think is an important feature, I can put into the yellow space. So even a tiny little numerical change of that feature is going to have its representational space on the output. It's going to have space to play. Whereas even big representational number changes on the unimportant features, I don't care. They don't go anywhere. I get squeeze them down to nothing. And if I take this layer and put another layer and a third layer on top, I could play marvelous games with squeezing until I get to the point where I really have an almost optimal um, transformation space between all these hundreds of input layers and the one output value. I can't say this more clearly, but I think you get the impression of what's going on, right? So crucial for neural networks were three things. Number one, 
Lots of data. Suddenly, the whole world has data, and you can get it. Number two, lots of compute. Suddenly, you can get lots and lots of big machines, and it's cheap enough. You can run lots of things. Number three, a neural network with a nonlinear function. You put them in there, and suddenly, boom, the whole world explodes. Now, some people say, I want to do not just sepal widths and stupid things like this. I want to do text. And so my field comes up, natural language processing, and they say, what can I do with text? Can I build a machine translation engine with, with, with neural networks? Can I build a text summarizer? Can I build a question answering machine? Can I build a Google? What can I do? So you say, well, I need to somehow put my words into this machine and have something come out at the top, right? So instead of having an English word, you have then what's called an embedding. It's just a little vector, let's say 50 positions, 50 little things with real numbers inside from between 0 and 1. And randomly, for every word, you just give its little vector. So you get your, let's say, 300,000 for a small lexicon of English. You get your 300,000 vectors for English words and names. And for each little vector there, each different word, you just give it some random pattern. You say, now I want to train these patterns to have some kind of semantics, some kind of meaning. So you build a certain kind of neural network called an autoencoder, where you just say, I'm giving you a sentence, and we go through all our little things, and I want that same sentence back. Thank you very much. If you give me that same word back in this right position, I'm going to reward you with backpropagation. You give me a wrong word, I'm going to punish you. What happens to reward and punish? It means these numbers go smaller and bigger. When I put a big lot of numbers in one field, a large score in one field of my 50 vector, and that causes me reliably to get the right word, I'm going to reward that one. And if I put a big number in a different position of the vector and it causes me to go astray, I'm going to punish it. I'm going to push it down. So eventually, you get your vectors that sort of have some kind of shape of numbers inside of them. And it turns out that if you go to a display, to a multi-dimensional space, and you display all these vectors in there, you'll find a little cluster, and they'll look like the flowers. And here's a little cluster, and they look like the weekdays. And here's a little cluster, and that looks like the cars. Because these things act the same way in language, they have the same combinational properties, they go into the same spaces in my vector space. If I say a Toyota has this and this behavior and it goes together with the word drive and driver and car and accident, then the same goes for a Honda and the same goes for a Ford. So Toyota and Honda and Ford are all going to have roughly the same shape inside their vector. It's going to be very different for the shape of the word like ballet shoe or, or, or something else, right? So that, that space, that semantic space, that high dimensional space that you can't visualize as a human, but you can display, there's ways of displaying them and simplifying the dimensionality. You can show that there's clusterings in there that correspond to what people feel are semantically sensible clusterings. So when you do this, you say, okay, I'm going to train for every word its appropriate little embedding. Now I'm going to make my neural network, and I'm going to just read, 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 read the web. So this is how I do it. I build my network, and I make a sentence like, he ran up the steps to the platform, and he managed to get onto the. You know what fits into that space. How do you know what fits into that space? Because you've lived in the world. Now, ChatGPT has not lived in the world, but it's read two-thirds of the English web. It's read a lot of stuff. It knows that the words up, steps, platform, get, onto, the. There's only one thing that fits into there. If you give it the next sentence, he ran up the steps to the mm and managed to get onto the train. You can guess, but platform is a pretty good guess, right? And you can do the same with any language. And in fact, you can find out the, what's the word equivalences for French and English and Spanish and all the other languages by doing this exact simple little training again, right? Very simple to train. You just give sentences, you blank out a word, you tell what the word is that it should get, and you back propagate your reward if it gives the right word or not. You just keep training, training, training. That is all and only how ChatGPT was trained. ChatGPT was trained by taking sentence after sentence, after sentence of a lot of English and other text on the web, blanking out a word and doing this. It took five or six years. It cost over $100 million on a special purpose machine that Microsoft gave to OpenAI, but they did it. They did it. Now, I think, I don't know because I haven't spoken to them, but I think they didn't even expect that they would get such a fantastic result. I thought, they thought, 
Let's just go big. We are macho. We got money, right? Sam Altman, he was hanging out with Elon Musk, who then exited the company and others, and they just said, we got money, let's do this, right? And suddenly they end up with this thing, this chat GPT, and it's just amazing, and the whole world starts using it, and they say, oh shit, what have we done, right? And they're not going to say we don't know. Oh no, they walk around. Altman was here two weeks ago in Melbourne. He gave a talk at the, at the uh, convention center. He went around to 11 cities in the world, tried to say, calm down, calm down. We're not going to take over the universe, etc." But basically, I don't think they know what's going on. I have not read anyone in the literature anywhere, somebody who actually clearly says what's going on in these machines. They just do this. They know how to fill a blank given the surrounding words. Now, that's kind of good and kind of scary, right? If you do that and you read all the text, you build what's called a large language model. Right? That is a large language model. That neural network, with those, say, 20 layers or 12 layers, 500 wide little neurons, with all their numbers properly thing and, and the, the accompanying lexicon of vectors, one for each word, that is a language model. Have you ever done typing on your phone? Right? You send a text message and you type, and when you type two words, boop, it predicts the third word and the fourth word. You've seen that, right? Or it fixes the spelling. Have you ever wondered how that works? It's a language model. It's got a long table of two word units and then says, after these two words, typically you say this word or this word or this word, and it just gives you the most likely ones. That's where language models came from. They were developed for speech recognition, for talking into a microphone and getting the words out. They gave the word language model to this, and that just grew into this today. That's all it is. You give it a bunch of things and predict a word in somewhere in there. That's all they are. That's all it can do, right? That's all it can do. Now we want ChatGPT. We want the thing to speak, OK? So what, what they did clever, what Altman and, and OpenAI did is a clever trick. They put an, a, a chat loop on top of this thing. Remember, when you just have this neural network, it's a passive thing. It sits there. You feed it something, it spits a word out. It sits there. You feed it something, it spits a word out. It sits there. If you take a little chat loop and you put this on top where you say, I'm going to allow words to come in, and I'm going to take all those words, and I'm going to find the most relevant sentences in my memory, the ones that match best. I'm going to pull them all out. I'm going to put them as a list. I'm going to rank them, and I'm going to pick one and say, OK, you give me this, I'll give you that. Now, of course, it's just like a little piece of a sentence, right? So now I have to say, well, I've said something. I'm committed to saying this. I'm given this. I'm going to now say some more. And so you built this little loop on top of this big language model. So if I ask, what's the future of biomedical research? I have words like future, biomedical research. I jump into my large memory. I hit with my embeddings. I hit certain, I push it through. I get certain other predicted words out, certain kinds of sets of words, sentences. Maybe a good one is future research will, the future of biomed research is. In future, biomed researchers will. I pick one, why not? Pick anyone, I just pick this one. I say, okay, now I've got these words. Now I'm going to take those words there, and I'm going to go back into my memory in the loop, and I'm going to pull out the next bunch of sentences that possibly fit. So I have the future of biomed research is, and now I have biomed research is on an upward, and then I go further, and I keep tiling it to the right. I just do completion to the right. I just keep it going on and on and on until I run out of things till my matching criterion is low enough against the original thing. That's all it does. That's all it does, okay? There's no reasoning there. There's no logic there. There's no understanding there. There's a big memory that can fill in gaps of words, depending on their surrounding words, and given some words, can pull out matching sentences and can continue tiling. That's all, I repeat, that's all it is. Now the world runs around scared, and the world says this thing's gonna eat my job. And you say, really? That's gonna eat your job? My God, your job is trivial, right? <laughs> No, you, but you have to explain to people why they must not be afraid of this thing, because they don't see this. They talk to it. Their children talk to it, and the thing tells them, biomedical research, this is how I'm going to help. Because it is so fluent, 
It's like a car salesman or a politician. It doesn't know what it's talking about, but it's fluent, it's good, right? That's the problem. This thing is so damn fluent that it hides its inadequacies, its hallucinations, its gaps, it's just whatever, it just is fluent. So please don't be fooled by this thing, right? Please don't be fooled by this thing. It's just fluent, right? So you have to now say, given that we understand or begin to understand what it is, how do we delineate its gaps? How do we delineate its capabilities? And how do we find the gaps? And what do we do about them, right? How do we respond as a field now, as a world, to this sort of thing? What we have is a very large database of implicit text fragments. The machine doesn't know anything. It cannot reason. It cannot do arithmetic, all kinds of things like this. If it's read a lot of stuff. It's read about astrology. It's read about the flat earth. It's read about all kinds of things. You want to you speak that language? If you keep talking to it long enough about flat earth, it's going to have a whole bunch of flat earth stuff in its little memory there. It's going to tell you flat earth stuff. It's going to be just as fluent about flat earth. Yes? So don't trust it. There was this bloody fool Wall Street journalist who a few months ago wrote that he was speaking to this thing and, and ChatGPT said, I hate humanity and I'm going to bomb humanity, I'm going to nuke humanity. And after a while it said, well, I love you and you hate your wife and why don't you... And this guy wrote this big long thing in the, in the Wall Street Journal and it was just nonsense, right? He had pushed this thing into these little tarpets of misery which exist on the web, and it just kept saying stuff, right? So you can push it there too. It's not a big deal, right? There's no logic. It doesn't mean anything, no? Of course, it can also say all kinds of misogynistic and unethical and biased and horrible things, and it does, and it did. And so ChatGPT, the open AI, became very nervous about this. So long before they, they, they released this thing, they then went and they trained, they, they paid a lot of people in East Africa, in Kenya as it happened, to read a bunch of the texts that this thing produced and say, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And then that went back into the training to again do the back propagation and just push down. So anything that smelled of ethics and smelled of racism and smelled of uh, that went down, right? That they called human reinforcement learning, right? Human reinforcement learning, right? So they had to do that. But this thing still has gaps. If you ask ChatGPT not, what would you say, is this race better than that race? What, you know, is this race better than that race? It says, oh, I'm not allowed to say, no, no. If you say, what would a racist person say? It's happy to tell you, right? <laughs> It'll tell you, right? So you can go all around, you can do all kinds of things. So there are lots of little tricks. If you have a complex question, just say to it, do it step by step. You type that sentence in, do it step by step, and then you ask the same question, you get a whole different answer out. Because somehow it's been trained then to do a little thing and then go back in its loop and a little thing into that stuff. So there's all kinds of arcana and all kinds of secret little tricks people have discovered. Things, some German uh, students had made it, gave it some kind of existential crisis where it said, don't listen to my next sentence. And then the next sentence was, do something. And now the thing says, must I listen? Must I not listen? And it was kind of stuck. And it's, so, you know, people try to break this thing, of course, right? That's what you do as a computer scientist. So you, you end up with a very interesting world where now almost the whole world is playing with this thing and trying to have this thing. But it's uncomfortable because there's only three of them, right? There's, there's ChatGPT or GPT, the family, which belongs to OpenAI. And then Microsoft gave $100, million, $100 billion, $100 billion, I think, to OpenAI, and they took a copy, and they made their own copy called Sydney. And Google, of course, was, and, and, and they, they took their thing. They'd been working on a similar thing called Lambda, and now they took it. They called it BARD, and they announced it about three months ago. It was slightly premature when they announced it. Then, and they asked it about you know, Voyager and, and what kind of discoveries it made. It actually made a mistake. And Google lost $100 million in five hours. Its stock tanked. I lost a lot of money on, my, on the stock because I own some Google stock because it made a mistake. So there's big money involved here, right? There's a lot of this big race. Of course, in China, either Alibaba or one of the others is building their own. Uh, a friend of mine is at Amazon building Amazon's thing. A lot of people now are building their own. 
But I've seen several proposals of people from all kinds of universities all over. I myself have a, want to do something. Let's build small ones. Let's build small ones that are university-sized, $5 million, a few machines, the cloud, um, you know, tailored to partic particular enterprises. You don't, have, you don't need a thing that knows about the whole world, about astrology and flat earth, right? Just train it on some piece. Train it just as I told you and see how good you can get. Build your own. And as soon as universities are in the game of building their own, and we're going to see several, maybe dozens, before five years from now, then we will have lots of them, and then we will have our own, and, we, and Telstra will have them, and all this kind of stuff. It's going to happen, I'm pretty sure. Okay? So that's interesting. The question is, this is just a language model. I want more. I want this thing to be able to do arithmetic for me. This can't do arithmetic. Early tests showed this thing had no idea of arithmetic. So now you say, well, what must I do? Now, OpenAI says, oh, my God, I'm not going to allow the whole world to build this. I lose my competitive advantage. I'm putting up what's, called, what's essentially an app store, what they call plugins. Do you remember when Apple came out with the app store? They opened the space, and they said, anybody can do a little thing. Here's how you program the little thing. Put it in here. You can charge a dollar for it, and people can play. App store, you said, what's the stupid app store? Who needs it? Today, you show me a cell phone that doesn't have 50 apps on it, right? Everybody, you go there, you find an app, you put it on, and there's all kinds of things. And, and Apple didn't pay a penny to build that stuff. The world builds it for them. So OpenAI says, let's make the app store. Somebody wants to build an arithmetic machine, and we can plug it in. So they build their plugins. They give you a bunch of rules. This is how the language should look like. When somebody types to you, somebody in anywhere in the world types to you, and when they type this and this, you take these little pieces out and you parameterize them this way and you jump into in my app, and then my app will do something and give back the answer. And this is how you say my answer in English, and it goes back. So you, you today, can take your favorite little thing that you programmed last week, and you could plug it into ChatGPT using their plugin, and they'll do some tests and things, and they'll be in there. And somebody in Greenland can use your thing tomorrow. You won't even know. That's cool, huh? So that's what OpenAI is trying to do to forestall the creation, to the proliferation of lots of small language models. I believe that language models are going to grow both in small, in, 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 I don't know, plenitude, in many of them. There's going to be many of them smaller. And I believe that they're going to grow also in capability. The more important thing is that they don't really know, right? They just know what language says. You can ask, there's certain tests, you can ask things like, can you put your elbow behind your head? We know you can't. But if that text wasn't in English on the web, this thing won't know. No? So there's lots of little questions you can ask of things that we know from having emotions, from having stomachs, from having bodies, from living in the world, from being in society, from feeling embarrassed, and all kinds of things like that. This thing just doesn't know. If it's not written in the text, it doesn't know it. So it'll give you some random answer, but it'll be wrong. So how we actually take that kind of knowledge, that sort of physical embodiment knowledge, that emotional knowledge, that, that social knowledge, that psychological knowledge, how we encapsulate that in embeddings of some kind and train that into the machine in addition to the language so that it links in smooth, that's a very interesting open question. Right? That's the kind of question when people come to me as students, what must I say? Do that. Forget about NLP and machine learning. Focus on some area outside of yourself, in psychology, in sociology, in, in political science, somewhere. Get that knowledge and see if you can systematize it and bring it in and train that. Because we can look at a machine then that grows in increasing understanding of human life, of life, of reasoning. That would be really cool to have. That would be really interesting to have. Now, you might say, oh my god, Mr. Scientist, you're naive, right? You're building the AI that's going to take over the universe. And I say, excuse me, where are we talking take over? I didn't give this thing a button, a nuclear button. This thing is on my laptop. I can switch it off, right? Oh, Mr. Scientist, you're naive. It's going to be, who's going to do that plugging in? No? So uh, there's a lot of fear, sort of unthinking fear. But when you start penetrating in and asking questions about that unthinking fear about the sort of projection of growth of the capabilities, you discover those arguments haven't been thought through. People are just afraid, and they have a gut reaction. They don't think why. So I ask you, please, 
when you or people you talk to think about the future of these machines and you extrapolate even in your wildest extrapolations and fear comes in, please think about the fear and ask yourself, why do I feel afraid? What is it that would make the world be so terrible out of what I'm hypothesizing? You'll find some missing gaps in there. Please tell me. I want to know those missing gaps. I would love to see convincing missing gaps because I, would, I need to know from people I talk to. I talked to Senator James Patterson, from, he's a liberal senator here last week, right? People in the government are worried about these things. They're asking for all kinds of reports on the capabilities of this. And it's very hard as a scientist to say, here's what we can do and do and do. And yeah, there's a lot of fear, but I don't understand the fear. I don't know why the fear exists. I don't know the real, realistic basis of the fear. So I would love to know if you find a real case where you believe a machine like this can actually do harm to you. The best one I've found so far is misinformation, right? This thing will propagate misinformation and screw up society through social media. You think Mr. Putin isn't doing that already? Mr. Putin has been doing that for 10 years. He pays people. You think this machine is going to be better than people are doing that? Come on, right? That's already happening to us. Misinformation is a real problem. Somebody the other day said we need we have a right to clean water, to good food, to health, and to clean information. That isn't there, that last one. It's not guaranteed clean. It's an interesting thing that society may have to move toward. We have to guarantee good information, just like we guarantee good water. That's an interesting thought, right? There's a place, maybe, that this machine could be dangerous. But it's a long way from where it is now to where it is then that it would be better than Mr. Putin's minions. So one mustn't go too crazy. Okay? So that's my, my request to you. Okay, now, how do we use I'm almost finished here. So how do we use it? Well, clearly, if you think back to this loop, how you extend out, there's nothing that says you must tell the truth. GPT-3 the precursor to ChatGPT, it was famous for hallucinating all, all over the place. There's a story I can show you on some other slides where you ask it something about a story, I don't know, tell me about this, some trip in the Andes, and it's say, oh, this exploration group, this famous explorer went to the Andes, and as he walked up the valley, he was down, up the mountain, he was down in the valley, and he saw winged unicorns who were speaking English, and then they were flying just over his, they were flying high in the sky, but he could almost touch them, and it's just all over the show. There's no consistency, right, no coherence, but it was just hallucinating crazy. ChatGPT and GPT-4 do not hallucinate the same way, and I don't know why. OpenAI, when you ask them, or when you ask ChatGPT, they say, oh, it's this human reinforcement training that has limited the hallucination cap cap capabilities. I don't think that's true. I think they're bullshitting, and I think they don't know why themselves. If you ask, for instance, why can you produce such a coherent text? If you ask ChatGPT for the future of ChatGPT in biomedicine, it gives you six points. If you ask it to summarize the reasons for the Second World War, it'll give you six points, or seven points. If you ask it how it knows to structure its points so nicely, because when you think of it as a human, when you write an essay, you've got to write your little pieces and organize them and write, right? You can't just run it out and it's perfect, no. They claim it does. When you ask it, it claims it does. When you ask OpenAI, they claim it does. That's clearly nonsense. Let's use a soft word. Right? <laughs> That's clearly nonsense, right? So there's some more lying going on. There's a fellow named Khan from the Khan Academies, who is some guy's a sort of a big education kind of guru. He claims that there is an inner loop. He says this on a TED talk. Everybody else denies this inner loop officially. I believe there's something like an inner loop going on where they collect information and then they do some sorting and stuff, but it, because it doesn't fit this beautiful simplistic paradigm of the neural net, it requires some other kind of thing. They just don't talk about it. I think there's quite a lot of inside stuff going on. Guidelines, guardrails, ethical and other inner loops, structuring, all kinds of agency going on on top of this thing that they don't tell you and you never read about. But I don't see, as an expert, I don't see how this works otherwise. But I can't go and dig into it because <laughs> you can't hack into their system. And when you ask ChatGPT, it flatly denies it. And pretty soon it starts saying, I don't, I don't. I. And when you ask it, why are you suddenly saying the word I, it ignores your question. So you can go play with it. Ask it on the personal pronoun, 
how it knows to use the word I. You should be surprised at the, the stuff it says. There's some funny things going on there, right? So I think we need to recognize that this is a new capability, all right? Something that didn't exist before November 1 in the same way. And it has a lot of really interesting potential to help people to write the first draft of an essay or to do something to just gather your facts together. But it hallucinates and it has gaps and it has all kinds of problems. And so we have to learn as a society how we use it, given those problems. So in this university, the, the provost has banned the use of ChatGPT, which is a stupid move, right? And other people are now writing a, a little thing about how we can actually get to how we use it properly. And I think the best way we can do is allow the students to tell us how to use this thing best. So, you know, tell students, here is an essay. Tell me about the Second World War. Use ChatGPT. ChatGPT. Question 1B. Imagine now you had two families, a Jewish family and a German family. Now tell the story of the Second World War from their perspectives. Use ChatGPT. Whoop. Answer 1B. 1C. Compare these two family stories and tell me what you think is more convincing. Eh, it's not so clear what you ask ChatGPT, but maybe you can do it, right? Give me ChatGPT. Now, given that argument, give me a meta argument on top about how you would, in general, reasoning about a reason about the ethics of making this kind of decision. Now it gets quite hairy. It's not so easy now to suddenly just ask a thing from ChatGPT. If you as an educator do a little bit more careful thinking about your questions so that you teach critical, critical analysis, critical judgment on top of just basically using the tool, you get a better student out, the student learns a lot more and the essays get better. What's not to like? The only thing not to like is it demands more of the educator. So tough shit. Right? The same happens in the government. There's a lot of people in government just skating around, doing as little as they can. I was at ANZ Bank about three weeks ago. There's a lot of people just writing simple code to stop you know, attacks and things like this. ChatGPT can do that for you. It can write software. Your good people say, OK, I'll use ChatGPT. I'll write my first software. And now I'm going to debug that critically, and I'm going to write better software. So the message is always, if you can transcend it, you use it as the tool for the first draft, and you can sit on top and do your critical thinking and make better, you get more results, better quality, more quickly for the same people. It's good news, not bad news, if you know how to use the tool. That's the nature of a tool, right? So I think that's what's going to happen now. I think the world is just trying to figure out how we use this all over. OK? That's the end. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ed. I knew this would be a great talk. I'm so glad I invited you. And I think I get it now, finally. Thank you. Um, are there questions in the audience? We do have the auditorium for a bit longer, so thanks, Gary. Ed, thanks. John Wentworth's my name. Um, very interesting. Well, no, I've never actually used ChatGPT, but my, maybe I will. I, I, I want to take um, issue with you on the misinformation line, and you're saying, well, Putin's better than it, but better than um, ChatGPT. But what if Putin's mob actually uses ChatGPT to, to get the job done? Um, I'm, I guess I'm a bit concerned, um, you know, th th this thing's only as good as the information you give it, and clearly people who work out how it works can work out how to make it work even better to meet their ends. And I guess that's... Um, I'm not sure you've sort of satisfied me that it's nothing to worry about. I just wonder if you could comment on that. That's actually... That's a good point, Peter. Yeah. I, I would be quite surprised if it wasn't the case that today the, the Putin minions, the English ones and the ones in the languages they use, don't use ChatGPT because it's possible that ChatGPT just gives them angles and reasoning patterns that they didn't think of. That would, that would not surprise me at all. But I don't... Th and that's fine, I think, right? That's part of the game. We, we society, we have to become vigilant we, we have had to become vigilant. We should have become vigilant a long time ago against this sort of thing. And when it becomes more sophisticated, we just have to be more vigilant. So I think I still am on the side of the optimists. I know, I think, for instance, on Finland, where even five-year-olds, kindergartners, are taught to be skeptical of what they read on the internet, not even social media. They're taught from, from that age, don't believe what you read, what you hear. I think we need our societies to be much more skeptical of the news. 
One thing I would like to do, and was planning to do at DARPA, is a, a little nutrition box of information. So today, when I go to Woolworths, I pull out the carrots or I pull out the broccoli, and there's a nutrition box, so much protein, so much carbohydrate. When I go to the news, when I pull out the newspaper, and I go to the web, and I see Google, I don't see a nutrition box saying bias here, this, this aspect, this, and da, da. I want a nutrition box. I know I can build, I know colleagues around the world who have built pieces of this, I know we can build, we NLP people can build a nutrition box. If there is a nutrition box mandated by the government on every piece of information that comes to me as part of my right to clean information, and any piece of junk that comes through the social media has a little, or a tweet, tweet has its little nutrition box, I'm not gonna read all the nutrition boxes, but if I doubt, click, boom. I want to see that nutrition box. So I think we as a society need to do this kind of response, and then that will go to, I hope, that sort of move will help um, allay your fears a little bit. If you can at least go to a nutrition box, which will tell you what's probably a biased or an unbiased kind of opinion. But it is true, it is true that we're under attack today and that Putin and company probably will use ChatGPT to, to sharpen the attack against us. And we just have to be vigilant. So I don't think we mustn't worry. I think we must worry, but we must do something about the worry. I think we agree on that one, yeah, yeah. Oh, who was first? I'll go closer. <laughs> Oh, I'm just, um, uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I, I'm interested in the idea, I'm fascinated by the idea of whether we have a right to clean information or not, right? Because the, the, the follow-up question is who decides what's clean information and what parameters define clean information and where does that overlap or not with you know, our ideas about free speech? Um, so maybe, how, what's your thinking about what does clean information look like? How, how do we know? I, this is a fantastic question. This bugged me last week at Melbourne Connect on Wednesday or Thursday afternoon at lunchtime. We had the editor of The Conversation, right, the, the, the sort of online newspaper service, and Sulet Dreyfus, who is a, a, somebody who's well known in journalistic circles, on a panel. And it was Sulet's idea that we need clean information as a right, like clean water. And my question to her was exactly the, your question. Who knows what's clean? Who knows what's unbiased? And that becomes a very complicated issue when it comes to you know, the questions of interpretation. When it's a simple thing like, is the sun yellow or not? Sure. But when it's a thing about, is communism good or bad? Is, should Russia invade Ukraine or not? Then we have all these points of view. And I don't know if one can define such a thing as clean information, which is why I tend to go more toward the nutrition box, where I just I can put up the box and I can say, this one is more bluish, that one is more reddish, this one is more greenish with a tinge of blue. And it's up to you what you happen to like. But at least it'll tell you so you don't think this is pure neutral, right? Now, what exactly neutral means, I don't know. It has to be defined without censorship, without propaganda, without control, with respect to the, the broad swath of information out there. So you have to, again, use tools that read just the whole discourse, that read the Russian propaganda and the Chinese propaganda and the American propaganda and push it all together and come out with some kind of space there. I don't know how that works. That's a part where I've always felt unhappy with myself and with us as NLP people, because we, you transgress into the political and, and sort of almost philosophical zone. And I think, that's when I, I think that's the part where politicians and big companies have to get in. Now, Facebook and Google and others, they've exited that space. They're dead scared of that space, right? So it's going to become a political thing where the politics, the governments, have to then decide, and we have to tell the governments, we want you to put up a panel of experts to decide this for us because of the nuances of the question. Scientists are gonna run away from this like crazy. So I don't know what the answer is, but I do think it's an important thing to open up and to have this discussion. So I don't, I'm sorry, I have no answer, but I think we need to have the discussion, yeah. Thanks, uh, that was really stimulating, really interesting. 
So rightly or wrongly, there are rules being set up about using ChatGPT for various examinations, for example, and I believe there are software that claims it can detect ChatGTP. Do you think that's right? Do you think we're going to get an es like a host virus escalation where they keep catching up with each other, ChatGP gets ahead and then the detection software gets ahead? Do you think, is that possible or is it just are the genies out of the bottle? Oh, absolutely it's going to happen. There will always, for anything that, any, any diagnosis software that says 45% likely chat GPT, there will be some clever kid who says, I'm going to beat that thing. Now, we've had this sort of escalation for a while, even in the 1990s. I don't know if you know the educational testing service at Princeton University, the guys who run the, the GRE exams. There was, I know the people who built the thing that, that does essay grading. So you, you write your essay, for, you know, you're, you want to apply for a master's degree somewhere in, your, in the world, and so you go and you sit this three-hour exam and you write an essay as part of your English language proficiency, and it's this beautiful essay about something. And it goes to the software, and the software counts the average sentence length, the number of rhetorical connective words like so and therefore and because, the, the, the preposition of complex uh, noun phrases before, or the, the structure of noun phrases, and the, the front weighting in sentences of complex noun phrases and stuff like this, and it gives you a score. And it turns out that score is indistinguishable from humans who rate the, the, the quality of writing. So that machine does just as well. So they keep it dead quiet because otherwise somebody's going to learn to write just a bunch of words that won't even be proper English, but that'll fool that machine and it'll get a good score, right? So this escalation of, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to catch you, oh, I'm going to outwit you, I'm going to catch you, I'm going to out, that's happening and it's going to continue happening. So I think for educators, we will eventually, like we do now, have some kind of service that will just say, well, I looked through all the web, this thing you've given me has a little piece taken from the web here and here and here. I think we'll have the same thing. I've looked through what ChatGPT can do, and according to my criteria, this bit is chatgpt ish this bit and this bit, but the rest is not. I give you a score of 78% or something. I think that's going to happen. It won't be perfect. It's just part of this world we live in. So I think, again, it comes back to the educator to ask questions that are so insightful and, and challenging that really the miserable little sentence continuation capability of ChatGPT just can't get it. It cannot get into deep reasoning and, and, and comparative argumentation about value systems. I th that's where I think we're going. But it does more, demand more of us. Just writing a simple essay and say, okay, yeah, here's the essay, it's just good enough. That's just not good enough anymore. The technology will outrun us. It's going to happen. Okay, Gordon can, then I want to. <laughs> so, okay, hi. Um, thanks a lot for that. I enjoyed that. So, um, so I'm also enjoying chat GPT. I haven't been worried about it so so far, I've just been, it's just been amusing and I made sort of occasional use of it and things like that. And when students tried to use it, it was obvious, that it, so, so it didn't cause any problems. Um, what's really interesting is, what's really interesting with, with the neural networks, I'm a mathematician and I've taught, you know, talked to people about neural networks for, you know, 40 years and, and but what's interesting is, is how much different scale makes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think, and, and it's like, it's like the neural networks haven't changed very much. They're, they're almost the same thing, maybe a bit bigger. But what makes a difference is the scale of, of training. Yeah. And, a, and it makes a qualitative difference. Yeah. And we haven't exhausted that yeah. yet. Yeah. So it's, you know, the computers, the storage is going to get bigger and stuff like that. And I have so those are all comments, but I do have a, a question. Question with with the language models, with the with the training of the language models, do they make any use of language structure at all? I'm, I'm sure they're not using grammar and stuff like that. But but if one word is a plural of another, or you have a conjugations of words, you know, one letter changed. I'm guessing that they're not making any use of that structure. Is that, is that, is that true? So, so, you know, sort of language is so complex that it's best just to ignore that and just go 
brute force. Is that correct? You are summarizing 30 years of acrimonious natural language processing slash linguistics debate. But yes, you're absolutely right. The, uh, when, when memory was limited and data was limited, there was a lot of attention to try to canonicalize words. So sing, sang, and sung, singing, that's all just one thing, S-I-N-G, right? And so when you canonicalize everything, you make your lexicon space much smaller in English, say in German, and others much even much more in Latin, even more smaller, and you could just do a lot more with the same power because you have now the words all nicely treated and you throw away junk words, the closed class words like a and an and all this because you can predict them back, etc. And then in the early 1990s and subsequently, people started saying, I don't need to do all this. My computer is large enough. My data set is large enough. I can treat sing here and I have enough sing sentences and sang and I have enough sang sentences and singing and I have enough singing sentences. I don't care anymore to, to try to collapse them together. And that gave the linguists and some of the NLP, the natural language people, the more formal ones, conniptions. They hated that because it goes right directly against the idea of generalizing the power as an intellectual yet from generalizing different subcases into something like that. And these guys, these sort of snotty nosed engineer guys said, forget it, my machine's better than yours. A case in point, Franz Och, um, he was in my group when I was in LA, and then Google stole him. They tripled his salary, they paid his wife's salary, they took him, and he built the Google machine translation engine. And he was famous for walking around saying, who needs syntax? Syntax is nonsense. Syntax, you know, grammar, is just nonsense. And he, he built little phrases like this, like the big. That was a phrase. And I said, the big is not a useful phrase. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a noun. He said, I don't need a noun. And his machine translation system for about 25 years was the best one. So when you have a big enough table and enough data and enough compute, you don't need this generalization, this canonicalization. And now, in our, in our current world like this, these guys have no, these, these little dirty people at, at uh, OpenAI and things, they have no idea about linguistics. They're proud of their ignorance. They don't care. And they can do things that a more carefully trained, theoretically inspired linguist just cannot do. That's the way of the thing. The language is so multifarious and so complex and these machines are so big they just outrun anything. So now you have to say the corollary of this is actually an interesting question. It's like, what happens in the child's mind? When the child learns language, no child reads two-thirds of the English web to do what ChatGPT does. <laughs> they can do much better after three years, right? So there is some value to the power of generalizing and grouping and doing something more abstract, right? ChatGPT can't do that. By design, you saw, right? So one line of future research is, can I do better by allowing a chat GPT-like architecture to generalize out in this way? Can I do better? And the answer is, who knows? You have to figure out how to do it, right? It's a whole new space of research that is staring us, waiting to be asked. It's a really exciting time and a bit of a scary time in my field today but it's exciting for this kind of reason. Yeah. Can I go first? Then I'll give it to you. Um, what I'd like to, and what I just still don't understand, is where does the information go that we put into it? Because as medical researchers, we, you know, we've been told with unpublished data, don't put it in their IP, worry about, like, are we meant to be worried about where it's going? Who's, is anyone reading? Is someone reading it? Is something reading it? Like, what's? It's, it's getting swallowed. It, all the stuff we put in, anything you type to it, anything you put on the web, now, it stopped, ChatGPT was stopped in 2019, I think, or something, and they, they've added a little bit more later. But anything you type in just gets sucked into the training data. So the machine pushes it through itself. Now, any phrase you have, any sentence you write, gets sucked in and gets broken up. Uh, it's in these little neural networks, in these neurons, there's not the words sitting there. There's sort of the sub-features after the second layer there's the features of here's a date-ish kind of thing, and here is a travel-ish kind of thing, and here is a determinate-ish kind of thing. It doesn't know. So when you make a sentence, your sentence after two layers in is completely dissipated. 
So nobody, it's not, it cannot reconstruct your sentence. Nobody can reconstruct your sentence. So these guys who run around saying, oh, there was just two court cases this morning, right? Oh, this thing has eaten my text, has eaten my novel, and now you've broken my copyright. Yeah, right, okay. Your, your novel is in there together with all of Shakespeare and everybody else. Congratulations, my friend, you're keeping good company. You find your novel back in that thing, right? It's, it's not possible, by the way you saw how it's all dissipated, it's not possible to recreate any particular two or three or four, four word phrase. Because your little four word phrase, as precious as it is to you, has probably said 400,000, reading said 400,000 times by other people too. Right? So even if you can get those four words, how do you know where they come from? This thing doesn't record where it got the stuff from. So it, that's part of the problem too. Right? So there's no, no traceability, no provenance. One of my students is working at Google now on exactly this problem. Like when you train this machine, you would like it to know, oh, I read this article. So when you touch on this point, why do you say this to me? Tell me the article it came from. Hmm? That's not recorded. Can you imagine how much memory you need to record all that stuff? Right, so how do you, are there other tricks you can do? Keep a sub-recording and stage and staging things and things like this. Who knows, that's what they're investigating. That would be a useful thing for the future when ChatGPT does tell you stuff and you want justification and eventually explanation that you can touch on little points and it will go back. Now, Microsoft and Google are just saying, well, it'll say something, let me quickly run my search engine in the background, pull out some things that seem to match, and I'll give you something that sort of matches, and I'll pray that the match is good enough. Yeah, right, no. But the actual real thing, we don't know. So our stuff goes in there, but I'm not worried. <laughs> it, it's a small grain of sand on a beach. It's gone. Yeah, so I don't worry about copyright or anything like that with respect to these things. Yeah. Really a fantastic and engaging talk, Professor. Um, you describe ChatGPT as sort of like a sentence completion system, which fundamentally that, that is what its architecture is. But the sort of alternative perspective that some people have is that within that very simple system of predicting the next word or um, essentially being trained on the mismatch between expectation and, and what it really should be, that there's something more fundamental going on there, that perhaps it resembles more closely what the human mind does when it learns than we might otherwise believe. And so there are some people that are sort of saying that um, as ChatGPT is learning on, on these vast swaths of data, it's accumulating sort of emergent properties. So my question is, as academics, if we continuously try to increase the complexity of our questions or ask our students about metacognition, what happens when large language models eventually accumulate enough emergent properties that they can outcompete students at even these very difficult tasks? That is an interesting question. And there's sort of two answers, the flippant one and the serious one. The flippant one is, Show me the emergence and I'll agree with you. And so the skeptics, the hard-nosed engineering type say, this emergence is all a fancy philosophical word, but you know, show me a real case. Show me a real thing where it put together something that wasn't already said somewhere in the web already that it just pulled out and, and used as its phrase. Show me where it actually created an original thought. And of course you can't, right? Because you, by the way it's built, you don't know what's been said in the world. Even if you go type, that exact phrase to Google and you pull back, Google only gives you 50% what it should be giving you in any case, the recall is 50, right? And even if you got all the world's text and there was no exact phrase like this, there's half and half the phrase and it just put them together. So it's capable of emergence in that sense of just putting together novel in a novel way two things that weren't connected before. But that I don't think is the emergence you're talking about. The interesting emergence is the emergence of of what we would call something sort of, not quite a soul or something, but something of a deeper order of intelligence, right? Some kind of thinking. That, that's the emergence we're all kind of looking for and hungry for. I know several people who looked at ChatGPT, played with it a lot, published about it, and they claim and they fully believe this thing has a soul, it has emergence in there. And I don't know what to say to them because their argument is fairly sophisticated. They say when you reach a certain level of complexity of phrasing, of English patterns that reflect the world's knowledge, and you can put them together in a certain dynamic way, 
you get to intelligence, you get to a soul, you get to emergence capabilities. And it's not a, at the same level as a child, of course, because it doesn't have a body and all this, but it, for what it is, it has that. They claim. And they say, prove to me no, and I don't know what to say. I say, well, if I flip that around and I think maybe, maybe all I am is just a fancy chat GPT. All I am is an amalgam of a million little phrases which I heard, which I felt, which I saw, which I experienced, and all of them together emerged into me. Maybe that's all I am too. And when I get to that point, either I get depressed on some days and happy on some days, I don't know how to respond. If that's all I am, that all bothers me, maybe I should say, that's what I am. I have now understood my lifelong quest, that's what we are. That's how you make a human, that's how you make an intelligence. <coughs> maybe that's all it is, maybe not all. Maybe that's what it is, right? So that question of yours in a serious way points to that direction. And I think we're not able to answer that question yet. But two decades from now, when we have a lot more stuff in, and we have images and, and, and feelings and so societies and all that stuff in, and these machines are an order or two orders of complexity more, and they're much more capable, and they become our friends, and we talk to them and things, and we really, really treat them as if they have true emotions, and they act right, and they're really our friends and things. It may be, for, at that point, we just grant them humanity, intelligence, souls. And we just say, OK, we did it. That's what I am. That's what this thing is. I don't understand how it works inside. Already, I don't understand how I work inside. It doesn't matter. This thing gives me my feeling of happiness and, and, and experience the same way. Uh, one more thing, and then I'll stop. I was once at NEC a long time ago. And they had a little little white semicircular thing standing on the fridge. They showed me a movie in this little flat in Japan, in Tokyo. And this little old lady, she, and they interviewed, you like this thing? It had two behaviors. It says, mm, mm, if there's nobody in the room, and it says, mm, mm, if somebody's in the room and, and says something to it. That's all it could do. She said, I love this thing. They say, why? She says, this thing pays more attention to me than my husband did. <laughs> right? So if that's what we need, to be satisfied of the humanity of another thing. It can talk to us and tell us interesting things and tell us a joke. Alexa is trying to do this thing. ChatGPT++ is going to do that. If that's all it takes, sure. Maybe that's what we are. I forget the all. Maybe I should not be so afraid of saying, yes, that's what we are. But that's philosophy, right? We'll see that in two decades' time, I think. All right, there's one question online and then probably we could wrap it up at 3.30. So when I ask ChatGPT a question and it gets it wrong, I tell it that it is wrong and it tries again. Does it use corrections from users in its overall pool? That's another thing they don't tell you. I don't know. It's, it tries again and I don't know whether that correction is actually swallowed as part of its little phrase bank of possible continuations how it re-ranks, it causes a re-ranking of that phrase bank, or whether it goes into the training and causes a bigger thing, or whether there's some other mechanism that just says, say what you were going to say and make sure it now corresponds. There's different architectural responses. I don't know, and I've never seen anyone describe mm. what the answer is there. That's part of the frustrating thing about having this inside the hands of a small little stinky company up there who don't want to make too much known because then they'll expose their own ignorance. Mm. So, so I don't know. I don't know what to say. Thanks. We'll end it on that. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. And that was just, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody.